Hello and welcome to an Infinity the Game Tactics video. This is optimistically the first in a series I'm calling Infinity 101, which I hope to use to present a bunch of concepts that will primarily be aimed at beginner players, but which might also be interesting to intermediate or advanced players, either just to listen to or perhaps to cover concepts that you're familiar with, but presented in a new or a different way. In this first episode, we're going to be covering, starting at the very beginning, and covering list construction. Before we begin though, I would like to thank my local community who I reached out to for ideas on how to name this series, all of which I have chosen to reject. So what we're going to be talking about here are three things. Now this is not an exhaustive list of stuff to think about when you are building a list, but they are three basic concepts that might be useful to you and which are good like building blocks when you're looking to progress from being a beginner player that knows like how to put a list together but not what makes a good list into an intermediate or advanced player. The three topics that I want to cover are one, why it is important to build your lists with the capacity to defend, two, how to get your second combat group right. This is a whole topic by itself and something people have been asking me about recently. And then three, how and why it's important to experiment with your lists. Let's start with the defensive topic. So the basic point that I want to make here is you have to build your lists to be able to defend. Defense is a capability that you build into a list because there are models and profiles that come together to let you defend. There are a lot of options for what you can be using to defend that will vary by faction. Different factions will have access to different tools, but it's really important to put those, those tools into a list. If you don't have a defensive plan, if you don't know what you're basically what you're going to do, if your opponent elects to go first and treat the mission as annihilation with extra steps, then you are at the mercy of the lieutenant role. And just go first, five head, is not a valid defensive plan. We could do a whole separate video on a, you know, a list of things and ways and stuff that you can put into a list that will let you defend. And in fact, I want to cover a video on AROs and defending generally. That might, might actually be the second episode in this series. But if you want a simple checklist of stuff to put into a list, I would suggest some soft AROs. So a hacking network doesn't need to be strong, but even one hacker plus a couple of flash pulse remote repeaters can give you enough coverage to stop a terminal approach into your deployment zone by a hackable element. Some hard AROs, you do need something that can be a gun, although, as I say here, any, any gun can play defense in a pinch. If you have a sufficiently robust heavy machine gun, that can, if you need it to, play as a long range ARO piece. Ideally, you also want some template defense, something with like chain rifles or shotguns or flamethrowers, something that can cover off on those final approaches into your deployment zone. And then finally, kind of more generally, do you have pieces that you are comfortable losing if you need to? A Delami or a Libertos or an Oxport or a Long Yard, these are classic pieces that are kind of tricky to remove, but which as a player, you can say, you know what, if this piece dies, the rest of my plan is still totally intact. On screen here, we have a sample list that is built with defense in mind. Now, it's a Toha list. I've taken this from the list that I took to CanCon. So it's going to have elements that not every faction has access to. But the point I basically want to make is this list is built first with defense in mind. And because it's built with defense in mind, I can play it knowing that if I want to go first, then I can just play the list aggressively. I can use the pieces in it aggressively. But if I am not going first and my opponent is going to take the first swing at me, I'm in a position where I am not going to be knocked out of the game if they swing sufficiently hard. At time of recording, it is April 2023, and Infinity does not yet have a mechanic that allows players to rubber band back into the game. So you need to be able to defend if you're going to successfully play from turn two onwards. This is a sample list that is built to do that. We can see a lot of pieces in there that are hard arrows. So we have snipers, we have both the Nickel and the Sukwell. We don't have hacking, but we do have tack wheel officers, which are very powerful soft defenses. We have a really good variety of very dangerous template defenses protecting sort of the terminal approaches into the deployment zone. 
if this if you close with this list you are going to wear either plus damage or plus burst heavy flamethrowers which are scary to just about anything in the game and then of course because it's toha it has symbiomates symbiomates basically play the role of designated casualties in a toha list they are a whole bunch of pieces of equipment that let me say okay i'm going to take a hit on my troop but my troop is not going to die the symbiomate is going to cop it instead so collectively this list performed extremely well on the defense it covers off basically everything that i might want it to and it's still totally serviceable at attacking but attacking with it is a question of how you choose to play the pieces that you have. Yes, there's offensive capability built into this list, but really what it is tempting to do first and foremost is just survive if I don't go first. And that paid off. It paid off multiple times in a way that was really important, which is kind of testament to how well this list performed over the course of the event. Like I mentioned, we can and probably will do an entire episode of this series on how to use these pieces and with more detail on what kind of pieces you want in a list. But the basic premise here is if you aren't thinking about how you should defend, start thinking about how you should defend. Whether it's things like, I'm going to put my tag on ARO for an order or two, or I don't have hacking in this list, maybe I can fit it in. Those are things that will take your lists from you know, a 50% win rate to a 55% win rate because they give you that edge in those scenarios where your opponent goes first and swings at you really hard. Also, this is stuff that will pay off over the course of an entire game. If you build a list that can defend, that's not just useful in getting to have your first turn, but it's useful at getting to have your second and your third. Okay, so our second second topic is how to get your second combat group right. This is something I've had, I think like three or four people ask me specifically about just in the last week. And so I thought it was something that deserved a slide. Getting your combat group right, your second combat group right is something that again, will really help you take your lists from okay to good. Because your second combat group, sort of by definition, is the group that is going to have fewer orders. I will usually, not always, usually do a 10-5 trooper split. Uh, it's a fine default, but other configurations can also work. I've seen 6-9 six, six, lists work really well. I've even seen 7-8 lists that work quite well, with the caveat that those are the ones that are usually most vulnerable to having orders stripped from the group you least want on the first turn. So if in doubt, I would suggest going a 10-5 split, but experiment to see sort of what works to you. Regardless of how you choose to set up your second combat group, it's usually going to be your group with the fewest orders that needs the clearest plan. It's going to have the least resources to work with. You're not going to be able to spend order after order accomplishing whatever goal it is you want. So your smaller group is usually going to be less failure tolerant. It can't try as many times as your first combat group to do whatever it needs to do. What that means is you need to use pieces that need fewer orders or pieces which only need orders sometimes. And your second combat group is generally going to be an excellent place for things that combine some qualities of fast or disposable or which are support elements. Stuff that only needs orders sometimes or only needs a few orders. Those are some general principles, but this is something I think is going to benefit from some clear examples. So let's actually break down a few in lists that I have either used or played against. So here are three five trooper second combat group lists that I have either used personally or played against personally. And we're going to break down how each of them works and why it is good. We'll start with this nomad second combat group. So in this nomad, we nomad second combat group, we have a gator. Now it doesn't list that here, but if that's not a gator NCO, it certainly could be. In this case, I think it's not, and that's fine. But there is a gator, there is a tag. Tactical armored gears can fit easily in both combat groups. If you put a tag in the first combat group, you're kind of saying this tag is going to be a significant part of my battle plan and I am intending to be able to maybe push aggressively with it. But the thing about tags is that tags are big, robust, tough, usually multi-heavy machine guns. Their general role is actually often going to be more like that of artillery on an infinity battlefield. They're there for fire support and suppression. If a tag is often going to be doing its job, if your opponent looks at it and says, well, I'm not putting any pieces on Overwatch. Uh, and in that situation, a tag has nothing to do because its role has been fulfilled just by its presence. And that means that 
often a tag actually goes really, really well in combat group two. Now that's not an adage, but if you're looking to build out a combat group two, you could consider putting a tag in there. One of the other things that the tag does is because it has tactical awareness, it has a degree of order self-sufficiency. You're gonna have in this combat group, you're gonna have six orders to spend. In fact, you're gonna have seven because we've also put our interventor lieutenant in this combat group. What that means is that the nomad list that is playing this combat group doesn't have a 10-5 order split. It has a 10-5 trooper split, but it has a 10-7 order split. And the presence of seven orders in, in basically seven orders in the second combat group means that it's going to be highly flexible. It also has a Morlock, and I think the Morlock is Morlock is important here because you really should acknowledge that the Gator and the Interventor in any given turn, although they are very likely to have something to do, in particular the fact that the Gator can shoot mines using its orders means that it is very often going to be a flexible second combat group piece. In Hacker's Lama, Magari Brigade is even better at this. But if you're not expecting to hack and you're not expecting to shoot with the Gator because your opponent is lying everything down and you have plans other than to missile them, for example, then the Morlock gives you something extra to do with that combat group. It's not an ideal situation that the Morlock spends all five of the orders plus it's impetuous in that group but it could either way this is a combat group that is using five models it leaves 10 free in the first combat group and as you have a lot of capability in here you have info war um, you have big guns you have defense and you have smoke and you have close assault and it will work basically with the with the order count that it has so now let's look at the varuna combat group here and this is a defensive and utility combat group uh, and it's going to see the appearance first of a forward observer remote, which is an ITS-14 consideration, but those are very common in my second combat groups at the moment. So what do we actually have here? We have a machinist with a palbot, we have a pathfinder drone bot, a peacemaker drone bot, and then two helots. Speaking to a Varuna and Spiral player of my acquaintance, um, their conclusion is usually that three is nice, but two is usually the correct number of helots unless you have something like a cutter in a list, which is very expensive and takes up a lot more air. Um, but two, two helots in this combat group, it's, combat group two is the obvious place for helots. They will sometimes spend their own orders. Uh, they will use those orders to move forward into sort of better positions. But if they're going to do that, then you want them in the combat group too, so they aren't sucking air away from your first combat group. You need to put them someplace, and combat group two is the logical position. Otherwise, what we have here is a machinist, and the machinist's job is obviously going to be to repair your tags typically and your remotes potentially. But the thing about that is that the machinist is only going to need those orders some of the time. And importantly, when the machinist does need those orders, it's probably to enable your larger first combat group to attack. If you have a cutter or a squalos in the first combat group of this Varuna list, then you are committing to lots of aggressive action. And because it's Pan Oceania, you're probably going to need to have your opponent suppressed in order to move in with your other pieces. So the presence of a tag maybe in your first combat group is important. And you don't necessarily want to have the piece whose job is to repair the tag sharing the order group with that tag because what it means is if your tag takes damage in your active turn and you decide to repair it you are taking air away from the tag which it wants to use to attack hence we have the machinist in combat group two it also means that if you have some spare orders in your combat group too, and you're like, mm, I don't really have much else to do, but you have a remote that's been downed, for example, then you can just usefully reconstitute your forces in a way that, again, doesn't take orders away from your first combat group. And in that vein, we also have the Pathfinder and the Peacemaker. Now, in ITS Season 14, that Pathfinder has tactical awareness, which means, once again, this is going to be a six-order six combat group, not a five-order combat group. And Pathfinders and pieces like them, I have actually found are just fantastic combat group true to models because they are fast and we talked about models that need few orders it's a 6-4 model it can get forward to do objectives it's utility it's got a sensor it's a specialist it's a moderate gunfighter which means that in a pinch it's got a good chance of being able to spend the six orders it has access to on kind of whatever you might need to do at the time. I would almost never put a sensor in my first combat group with the intention of running it forward and censoring some camouflage markers because that as an, like, as an offensive route is probably going to be inefficient. 
but a combat group two model that hasn't had orders stripped from it on the first turn, yeah, I'll make some discover rolls. I'll make some sensor rolls. That's useful. That's utility that is supporting the offensive action of my primary combat group. And then we have the peacemaker. The peacemaker combines a lot of these pieces and also is this group's offensive element because it forward deploys. It's pre-staged for an attack and it's fast and it's disposable. It has that ox board. It has its heavy shotgun, etc. Uh, if you need to, if you have laid down some suppressing fire with the Squalos and you're ready for something to move in, the five orders that the Peacemaker has to spend is probably enough to deliver it to the opponent's deployment zone because it's fast and because it's forward deployed and do some real damage with that heavy shotgun and flamethrower in a way that doesn't, again, draw oxygen from the first combat group. Say our first combat group is a Fusilier Link, some other pieces, and a Tag. If the Tag has spent, I don't know, four or five orders suppressing enemy ARO pieces uh, and you have other things you need to do with that group and that group has had orders stripped from it, you might not have enough orders to actually Actually deliver the peacemaker all the way to the deployment zone if the peacemaker is in group one but in group two if your opponent strips orders from it then your tag can go crazy they're more likely to strip orders from your tag which means your peacemaker has just enough orders to make a clear run and then finally we have the dash at combat group two which combines a lot of the pieces above but what we also have here is we have the presence of we can see the rafik remote that's our forward observer remote we have a monstrucker engineer but the pieces that make this combat group really work are a total reaction bot and two Coom Riders. Now, total reaction bots I will usually put in the second combat group. We talked before about the importance of a defensive plan and, uh, you know, designated casualties, etc. A total reaction bot is often going to begin your turn unconscious and be repaired. That's just kind of its nature. That's the role that it's going to play. It may very well kill some things. They are absolute crit magnets with our total reaction bots, but there's a good chance that it's going to go down, which means that you are accepting that its death is going to take orders away from a combat group, so its logical place is combat group two. But to compensate for that, we have we have the Rafik, which is very order efficient. And then of course we have the Coom Riders. The Coom Riders are among the fastest models in the game. They are on motorcycles, which means they are eight, six move, and they can be deployed impe impetuous. It is very easy for Coom Riders in a small number of orders to rapidly cross the board and do some damage. That means even if the group has only four orders because the Shehab is down, an impetuous Coom Rider will easily reach, th they'll cross the halfway line with their impetuous order and can reach the enemy deployment zone with their irregular order under ideal if unlikely circumstances. They are fantastic second combat group models because they are so, so fast. Motorcycles are an excellent, anything that's sort of that equivalent mobility is an excellent piece to put in combat group two. Although I would say the caveat of if, for example, you are a Yuching player, probably not a Sujan in combat group two, because a Sujan is not the kind of unit that is disposable enough or unimportant enough to only have five orders. A Sujan is a 10 order piece. It fits in combat group one, but a Coom Rider is expecting to hit the enemy defense, do some damage, maybe hit the enemy second line by using Doggard, do some more damage and then die. A Sujan is expecting to do a great deal more than that. It doesn't fit in combat group two, but Coom Riders absolutely do. So I hope this has given you a basic idea of how I would suggest building second combat groups. There are probably absolutely uh, other configurations that can work, but if you follow the basic principles of having a clear plan for your second combat group, using pieces that are either very order in a very order efficient or which only need orders sometimes to supplement the efforts of your main combat group, you will have basically good results. The final thing I want to cover in this video is just to express the importance of experimenting with a list. Uh, it is totally fine to netlist. It's totally fine to start with stuff that is popular. It's probably popular for a reason. People will cotton on pretty quickly to the stuff that is at least first order optimal good. Tags are good, link teams are good, good skirmishes are good, obviously optimal profiles are good, etc. Use that stuff. It's good for a reason and it will give you a baseline to work with. But don't just use that stuff. Experiment. There is a huge advantage in using unique lists and profiles. And that's not just me carrying on for the sake of wanting some novelty in the game, although it is worth noting that playing stuff that no one else plays can be really fun and fulfilling. But Infinity is an extremely complex game. It's a game that is very difficult to make decisions in. And when humans are under decision-making stress, or in fact, just generally, we fall back on experience and habit when we are making when we're making decisions. This is basic human decision-making. It's baked in evolutionarily, evolutionarily and with 
that means is that experience and experiential advantage is a real advantage in Infinity, and it's one that can outweigh model strength. If you are using a piece that is, say, 5% less mechanically optimal than the meta standard, but you have 15 or 20% more experience using that piece than your opponent has playing against it, you are probably in a stronger position than if you were using the on meta more standard and accepted piece that your opponent is very experienced playing against. There are lots of experienced players in the game, and many of them will have good standard operating procedures and baked in practices for dealing with stuff that is common. In fact, that's kind of the purpose of future videos in this series. But if you're running with something that your opponent hasn't seen before, or maybe like has seen, but they have to actually stop and think about what the situation where they saw it was and how it played, they can't just fall back on their good practices easily. That will give you an advantage. And as noted, it's fun to do that kind of stuff. So the basic idea here is experiment with your lists. Find things that are like 5, 10% off meta, but which you can make your own and you can build some experience with that your, your opponents, regular or irregular, won't have. In terms of experimenting with a list, there are two basic approaches that I like to use depending on what I'm trying to do in, with my exploration of a faction. One thing, the, the and honestly, probably the best way to do this is if you have a decent base of knowledge on how to play a faction, then throw in singular wildcard elements. Uh, if we think about how we would actually conduct experiments in a scientific sense, you would usually seek to change one variable at a time. Change one variable and see how it performs, because then you will know against your control whether the variable, how the variable is performing. Now, the problem with doing that in Infinity is that in this sort of analogy, one game is an experiment, and most of us don't get to play lots and lots and lots of games. I consider myself to play Infinity a lot, and for me that still means one or maybe two games a week if I'm not playing a tournament. And in that context, it is very possible that in any given game, the piece that you want to try out as the wildcard element it might just not be its game. It might be a game where you didn't need it. Maybe you're a Morat player looking to experiment with different Rindak profiles, which have tons of potential, but are not going to necessarily be a fit in every single game circumstance. You have to play it a couple of times, and you might not have enough games to play in a week to be able to do that. If you can't do that, then option B is to just take the total test bed list. Take a list where you have like literally everything that you want to try out, and just see what sticks. Throw everything at the wall, and accept the fact that you are playing a list that maybe, in fact, definitely is deeply suboptimal, but will give you the most possible chance to try some things out. Those games can be really fun and really interesting. It can be challenging to play them into, like, if your opponent is like, hey, I bought my completely on meta list, which has tons of things that are basic and strong. You kind of have to accept that you are going to be playing a little uphill in that circumstance, but from it, great things can emerge. Basically, panning for gold is one of the most interesting and useful things you can do in Infinity, and finding stuff that works for you, uniquely for you, is super, super both competitively optimal and fulfilling. Just as a couple of worked examples again, here are two of the lists that I played when testing lists for Starmada ahead of Anzac Cup. Um, these won't necessarily make a great deal of sense, I'm not going to drill down into them in any great depth, but the one on the left is the total test bed list for Stamada. This list took like five or six different concepts, all of which I wanted to test, and it played all of them, and I had one game with it into a Bakunin uh, Moira-based list, and certain things worked really well, and certain things were very challenging, and we were playing Rescue, and after the Raptor went down, I realized that I had almost nothing that could reasonably rescue, uh, rescue an, enemy, an enemy HVT, but it was still really interesting. In particular, trying out Shona Karano was really useful. I did decide ultimately that she probably wasn't for me. Um, there were other ways I could find of dealing with problems that I had. Also, she got shot by a submachine gun and died because she's not shock immune for some reason. But there was a lot that happened in the game that I got to test. I got to really try out the Raptor, and it really performed quite well. Uh, you'll see in Combat Group 2 that I have both an Engineer and a Doctor because I was experimenting with like really heavy focus on force reconstitution. And yeah, I actually ran, I spent five orders running the Doctor's Yard bot all the way across the table to recover the, um, to recover the Raptor after it went down so I could go and trinity my opponent's lieutenant to death. Um, 
this list was it was totally a test bed and I had to scramble through the game to make certain things work, but I got to find things that I really liked. On the right, we have a list that is stuff that I know is good that I chose to basically experiment with configurations and trying out like, you know, a couple of different bits and pieces. So we have uh, we have the Law Keeper with Combi Rifle and Sidebot. Let's see how that goes. We have just one Sarko Mine Layer, which I think this list I played as one of the first lists that I was using a Sarko. We have uh, a Peeler, we have just the one Hacker, we have no, no three-man link team in this list. But this list has a Zeta in it, right? It's going to, it's got a Zeta, it's got two Okos, it's got a Roadbot, it's got two Varangians. The core of what the list is doing is fundamentally solid, and if all else fails, I will have Big Gun and Smoke and Specialists in order to do do the stuff that the game needs me to do. I have a defensive plan, I have an offensive plan, I'm trying out bits and pieces around the fringe, in particular the Law Keeper, the Sarko, and to an extent actually the, the Missile Bot as well. I eventually came to the conclusion that the Missile Bot was really not needed in 012, it was a luxury but hardly essential. So these are just two different lists that I played, and I had I think five or six games with Starmada ahead of the event, that's a lot of games. That's a lot of games to be able to experiment with. That was a sort of a luxury that I had in the run-up to the event, because we had other local players that were experimenting as well. Um, and just, again, a bit of an example, two different ways. I eventually found, I think I settled on what I would call lists that were like 90% what either either meta or which will become meta, but I was really happy with how they performed and with the little Psychop duos that I had going on. I think probably the most meta Starmada list right now would use a five-man Kappa link instead, and probably wouldn't run, wouldn't just raw dog a Zeta Lieutenant with no chain of command, but I made decisions and I really enjoyed the games that I played with those lists, and they performed obviously really well. So that concludes our first episode of Infinity 101 talking about list construction. Just to recap really quickly, our three things that we covered are 1. Build defensive capability into your list. Plan your defense when you are constructing your list. 2. Build your second combat group with a plan, and we covered a bunch of ways that you can potentially plan to have a second combat group. And then three, just emphasize that it's super useful and important for your development as a player to experiment with your lists, to try new things and find what works for you. As always, if you like this, please consider sharing it and let me know what you found interesting and ask questions. I will do my best to answer and your questions turn into future video content like this. As always, thank you very much and I'll see you next time.